Okay, welcome back. Let's uh, quickly uh, explain where we were. So we have a notion of infinity spaces, which are, which are special functors from finite pointed sets into spaces satisfying the Seagull conditions. Uh, and we have spectra. And we have a functor omega infinity from spectra to infinity spaces. Oh, sorry. For some reason, okay, I decided to, to, to spell space explicitly, so I probably should keep doing it. Uh, and this sends E to the functor omega infinity, sigma infinity blank tensor E. And this is a this this is a monoid. It is in space uh, because spectra has direct sums and omega infinity respects products. So omega infinity of E plus F is omega infinity of E times omega infinity of F. Because it's a right adjoint. So, so you can see that indeed it's, it has the, the property, one of the pro this functor omega infinity E has the property. Another way of phrasing the Siegel condition is that it sends wedges of finite pointed sets to products of spaces. Okay, so this should be. Uh, easy and it's also obvious to see that it preserves uh, limits so we expect it to have a left adjoint uh, which it does which is this b infinity which sends m to the spectrum b um, where I use the previous lemma to show uh, well I'm not sure I need the previous lemma for this oh no 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 I didn't sorry but this is but, but, but where I use the lemma to say that uh, if m is a commutative monoid an infinity space, then BM also has a canonical infinity space structure. So while before, when you had an E1 space and you take the classifying space, you just get a pointed space, what's sometimes called an E0 space. For an E infinity space, if you take B, you get an E infinity space again. Okay. Uh, Okay, and now I promised you that I would show you that B infinity and omega infinity indeed are adjoint. And to, to prove the recognition theorem using this fact, which is really, really easy once you have this adjunction and what we already did. So, okay, questions about this? Yeah, could you quickly remind me how we define B? Just to that so remember. remember B M. So remember, if M is a is a monoid, B M was just the colimit of a delta M, a delta op, sorry, of M. But okay. Now, if M is a commutative monoid, I actually, okay, I didn't say it like this this like the other way, but. Uh, maybe it's easier to say that say that this lands in monoids in commutative monoids. No, okay, this probably is confusing. Uh, let me say BM. I want BM of I plus, and I'm going to say this the colimit over delta op of M of I plus wedge uh, this gap blank plus, and remember this gap. Blank plus was just a functor from delta, uh, sorry, from um, 
okay, from delta op to finite point of sets uh, that uh, uh, that we used to get an E1 space out of an infinity space, a set of gaps. And every gap is sent to the set of gaps uh, Full, sorry, every gap is sent to the gap into which it falls, if there is one or to the base point otherwise. I think I spelled it out explicitly last time. It's in the notes anyway. Okay, so that's the definition. Excuse me, um, by E infinity, you now mean commutative monad. Yes, oh, okay. I, think, I think I always use this terminology. I might have made some mistakes at some point. A commutative monad in spaces is what's called an infinity space. Uh, it's a historical terminology, but it's also snappier to say than to say community more in spaces. So, uh, okay, I'm using it. And also, if I say, oh, I just take a, a community monoid, uh, people might think I'm talking about community monoid in sets, and it's even worse when you say an infinity group. Uh, people might think it's a group in sets. So, I think I'll, I'll stick with using the traditional terminology for clarity. Okay, uh, but is this, uh, is this clear? And they use the fact that colimits over delta op commutes with products. To show that this is indeed, uh, it satisfies again the Seagull conditions. Okay, questions? So the first thing I'm going to do is to give you a map M from omega infinity B infinity M. And that's actually quite easy. So I think I should call this eta. Because this, if you look at the definition, this is just omega of B of M. And I already gave you uh, such a map. Uh, but now using the fact that I can use the easier structure on omega is going to be even simpler uh, to give it as a map of commutative monoids. Because I just need, so I just need a diagram. of commutative monoids or all inf of e infinity spaces. And uh, that's fairly easy. I'm just writing down what the functor is. So here I'm going to take the constant functor at the zero plus, which is again a commutative monoid. And it clearly receives, I mean, it's a terminal object. So it clearly receives some map from M of I plus. And this includes Put this, sorry. Which is just BM of I plus. I just need to give you such a diagram for, for every I in a natural way. And that's, uh, well, there is only one possible such diagram essentially. So, uh, That's what you obtain. I mean, you, won't, you can see these as I plus slash one plus if you want. And, and you, you, uh, the same way in which I defined it in the case I is the point, you can get the same definition for every I and it's naturally in I. Okay. Good. Okay, so this gives me eta. And uh, the other map is slightly trickier to define. In order to do that, first I'll construct an epsilon map that doesn't go from B infinity omega infinity m, but from B omega m into m. And if you remember, I already defined such a map when uh, M was a space. And in fact, 
I just take uh, for every I plus, I take the, the map. Map of pointed spaces. We already constructed. And this is natural in I because it was a natural transformation of pointed spaces. So now, <coughs> claim this epsilon and eta and epsilon satisfy the triangular identities. And they do so because they did that pointwise. And you can check that everything was natural. And so, so B is left adjoint to omega. Now, omega from commutative monoids to commutative monoids is just the loop space. Functor in, in commutative monoids in spaces. So these forces, B is the suspension from commutative monoid space into commutative monoid in spaces is the suspension functor. So the point why the, the loop space is computed as in spaces, but in, uh, in the, the suspension is not computed as in spaces, this other classifying space functor. So this B infinity notation that I chose was analog to the notation for sigma infinity. And it's not a coincidence. It's because it's essentially the same kind of construction. Only it's easier because community moments are closer to, to spectra than spaces as well. OK. Uh, now I want to get a, a map, uh, B infinity, omega infinity, E into E. And how do I do that? Well, I need to give you for every n a map bn omega infinity e into uh, the nth space of the spectrum, which I'm going to write like this. Remember, this is just the nth space. And I need to, to give them in a compatible way. So I said the obvious diagram. I mean, I also have to provide you with homotopies of the obvious diagrams, but they will, will come for functoriality. So I need map of pointed spaces. And I'll do something more. I'll give you maps of commutative monoids. And we choose, sorry, the underlying maps on spaces. Have some pointed spaces coming from the map of E infinity spaces adjoined to the equivalence. Omega infinity E goes to omega n, omega infinity sigma n. So this is, if you want, E0 equivalence to omega n E n, which we have because it was a spectrum. So that's kind of tricky if you want, uh, but really not much is happening. So I need to give you a map of pointer spaces. Well, I'm going to give you a map of uh, mono, uh, commutative monoids. In particular, this is going to give me a map of pointer spaces. And, uh, and uh, well, and this map of commutative monoids using the fact that B was the suspension in commutative monoids is just adjoint to an obvious map. Okay. So let me call this also epsilon. Maybe it's this, even the same name is, is a bit confusing, but it's a map in a different category. So uh, the first was a map of commutative monoids, and this is a map of spectrum. So hopefully, there is not going to be ambiguity.
Questions about this construction? No? Okay, then Lemma. Hmm? Uh, sorry, uh, I'm a little confused. So what precisely are we doing? We do not have the co-unit map yet, or do we have the... I just defined it. I mean, I haven't proven it's the co-unit map. I haven't proven it's an adjunction yet. Uh, okay, wait. So, and how did you define this map? I gave you each component. Okay, to be honest, I also should give you... Uh, ah. I should also give you the homotopies, but they 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 follow by a junction. Actually, let me. Uh, I actually also should give you a homotopy of the diagram. Uh, sorry, omega, omega, b m omega infinity e uh, omega sigma m e. Should also give you a homotopy making the diagram commute. But I, if you, I mean, if instead of trying to construct a commutative diagram of pointer spaces, you try to construct a commutative diagram of, of commutative monoids again by a junction, this is just. Uh, where was I? Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, well. It, it, it's not logical, actually, if you, if you try to to show that this diagram commutes a commutative monoids, I mean, because it is suspension of omega, suspension of omega, uh, where was I? Well, okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I, I can use the adjunction and see that this diagram is adjoint in the vertical direction to the to the, the diagram with the identities here. And here, this is not the identity actually. And then this is adjoint in the horizontal direction. To a diagram with identities everywhere. Well, okay, they're not really identities, they are canonical equivalences in the right vertical map case. But you, you, can, you can play this diagram with the junctions and see that uh, this homotopy has to. Has to, to, to exist. There is a canonical choice for homotopy. So let me make this small, maybe. Uh, but okay. Because what I'm caring about is that lemma eta and epsilon satisfy the triangular identities. Again, so there exists an adjunction B infinity, omega infinity. And the proof is again not particularly not particularly deep. Um, So let's see what, which one I want to prove only one of them. Let's see. Yeah, let's check. That this composition is the identity. So this one is omega infinity eta and this is uh, no, sorry, this is eta omega infinity, and this is omega infinity epsilon. Yeah. Okay, but what this is? Well, this is just omega b of omega infinity e. This is the canonical identification, and this is 
Well, this is omega of the, of the epsilon at the level uh, of the, so I can, this is omega of epsilon level of infinity spaces. Yeah, if here I write omega infinity e as, as this guy for sigma e. And the, the and this follows from the definitions. Because um, this map is just, yeah. This map in the end is, is the diagram is commutative with the canonical identifications. So you just get the identity. Okay. But once we have that, you can actually get the recognition principle for connected spectrum. Oh, actually, before I do that, maybe I should define what a connected spectrum is. Um, so I said it already, but let me give the official definition is spectrum is connective if pi i of e is zero for all e less than zero. So theorem, which is the recognition principle for connective spectra, And uh, um, okay, what does it say? It says so here let M be a commutative monoid in spaces and E a spectrum. So we have a bunch of properties. The first one is this map eta here Oof. is an equivalence if and only if M is a group. Is an infinity group. Then the infinity of n is always connected. And the third is that this map epsilon is an equivalence if and only if. E is connected. In particular, the adjunction B infinity omega infinity restricts to an equivalence between E infinity groups and connective spectrum. So this. Maybe we should say this is connect subcategory of connective spectra. Okay. Is the statement clear? Okay, now the proof is easy. Let me give numbers one, two, three. One, we already did. Since we can check, get on the underlying monoids. Because remember, this is just the map omega b m and okay it is a map of infinity spaces but to check it's an equivalence you can check it on the underlying spaces even but for for the underlying monoids at least and we've seen uh 
in the recognition principle for loop spaces that this map is an equivalence if and only if pi naught of m is a group. So that was actually the hard part, but we already did it. So two, we just need to check uh, p i of b in p sorry p minus n of b infinity of m is zero for n greater than zero, but these remember the definition is just p zero of b m of n. And again, we have seen that b m of n is connected. And then three, well, three is, is again very easy. So certainly since B infinity is connective, uh, if they're an equivalence, E must be connective. So if epsilon equivalence, E must be connective. Vice versa, because B infinity is if E is connective, epsilon is an equivalence on all uh, non-positive uh, homotopy groups. Sorry, all, all negative, not non-positive, all negative homotopy groups. And uh, uh, that's because they're zero for both spectra. So it's enough to check Omega infinity of epsilon is an equivalence, but then by the triangular identities, in fact, it's the one I just proven. So here we have omega infinity of epsilon, and here we have eta of omega infinity of E. That's an equivalence because omega infinity of E is group like. And that's the identity. And so omega infinity of epsilon is an equivalence. The end. Uh, OK, and that was the proof. It's very anticlimactic, if you want, uh, because we did all the hard work before. But the theorem is an important one. Let me restate a corollary that we saw last time. So we have abelian groups, it's just group objects and sets that lives inside connected monoid uh, in spaces. And this embeds into spectra. This is equivalent via the infinity to connective spectra. This, of course, embeds into spectra. And well, what does this do? It sends an abelian group A to some spectrum, some connective spectrum, such that omega infinity of E is A. What does it mean? Well, it means that E can only have pi zero. I e pi i of e is zero if i is different from zero and a if i is zero. Uh, because, well, we don't have many other, the negative homotopy groups cannot be there because it's connective and the positive cannot because omega infinity. And so, said so differently, this is the functor sending a to h a. to the Alma McLean spectrum that I described to you earlier. So this is indeed a fully faithful embedding of abelian groups into spectra. Okay. Okay, so let me define two 
important guys that we get out of this. So if N is a commutative monoid, this already defined it for, for monoids, but I have the group completion, which is omega Bn, which is in fact a commutative monoid. Just recording that the group completion stays a commutative monoid. And it's the, and, sorry, M goes to M group is the left adjoint. To the inclusion. Um, groups into committed monads. Here's the group completion. And that's called the group completion. And it's going to be the protagonist of the rest of today's class. But I want, before I do that, I actually want to introduce another important object, the spectrum. Then I'm going to define its connective cover as B infinity omega infinity E. So it's the connective cover. And this is the, and E goes to the connective cover is the right adjoint to the inclusion of connective spectra into spectra. And in general, I can define the N connective cover T greater or equal than N E is just a sigma N T greater or equal than zero sigma minus N E for every N, uh, sorry, in Z. And it is the, the right adjoint of inclusion of N connective spectra that are those spectra that have no homotopy groups in degree N. It is the right adjoint. So these are spectra with homotopy groups all in degree greater or equal than N. So should just pi i e is zero for all e less than n. This is just because the suspension is an equivalence and it shifts these categories into the next one. So it's not doing much. And so using this universal property, oh no, sorry, let me say first also the N truncation. I was forgetting about this. Is the cofiber the map from the N plus one connective cover to E. And this has the, the dual property that the map from E to the N truncation is an ISO on pi star for star less or equal than N and pi star of the N truncation is zero for star greater than N. That's because this map has the dual property. This map is an equivalence on homotopy groups in degree from N plus one and everything, and it's the zero otherwise. Okay, sorry, this was a bit of a barrage of definition. Is it clear what am I doing here? Maybe why do we need in the definition of N truncation the cofiber and in the N connective? In the definition of n, in the other definition, we we simply can forget the other. Um, oh, that's because I I I I have the, this functor here that's coming from our our theory. There are other ways of actually constructing this functor by adding cells to kill all homotopy groups, but I like that we can get it from this description. And anyway, 
it boils down in the end, we have a tower. So E maps to this tower, T lesser or equal than N, T lesser or equal than N minus one, whose, whose limit is E and whose co-limit is zero. This just follows by playing with the universal properties. And the co-limit is zero because the homotopy groups do commute with co-limits. And the limit is E, this requires a tiny bit uh, more of care, but since every tower, is, the, the sequence of homotopy groups is eventually constant for every degree, the map to the limit ends up being an equivalence on an isomorphism on all homotopy groups, so an isomorphism. In general, there will be a limb one term, but uh, I want to, to say that I just want to name this because it's very important, this is the Posnikov tower. And you can think of it as a filtration on E whose nth layer is uh, the fiber E, which is exactly the nth suspension of H by N of E. because uh, this map is an isomorphism on all homotopy groups except in degree n, where it's just a map from pi n of e to zero. So the fiber has only one homotopy group in degree n, and it is pi n of e. And so you can filter every spectrum by allenberg maclean spectrum. And that's a very important fact. That, uh, I'm not sure if we're ever going to use it in this course, probably, maybe later, but it's certainly a very important fact that it is often used and I wanted to mention it. And this is related to the so-called Atiyah here's the book spectral sequence. This gives you a other filtrations with homology groups that can be, sorry, with layers that can be computed in, the, in terms of cohomology of stuff. Unfortunately, time is limited. And I want to give a very short introduction to the properties of group completion, even if I want to be able to do everything. Um, so questions about this? No. OK. Good. Okay, so the next topic is going to be group completion. And actually, I, okay, it's not on the notes yet. I actually wrote a very detailed treatment of group completion in the notes. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm doing, going to do all in the class because I want to talk about vector bundles also before Christmas and, and key theory. Uh, but uh, I, I have to tell you at least something. Uh, so, okay, we, de we define the group completion. And now the goal is define group completion. Sorry, not define, describe and not define completion for nice monoids. So, in general, Throughout this section, M will be a commutative monoid, an infinity space, and X is going to be a point in pi zero of M, such that for every Y, there exists a Z with Y plus Z is N times X for some N in Z. Every, every other point is a summand of some multiple of X. This happens, for example, 
Well, there are a bunch of examples. The most common is going to be phi zero of m is the natural number, x is one. That's a very boring example, but it's like 90% of the examples we will consider. Uh, but more generally, if phi zero of m is finitely generated with generators x1, xr, you can take x just their sum. It's an exercise you can see what it is. So this is not it's crazy. In fact, usually what you do is you write every commutative monoid as a filter colimits of monoids for which phi zero is finitely generated and then apply the results that we're going to describe to that setting. But okay, this is the standard assumption. And if you, okay, if you want is an exercise that this is, this X has the property that you want, but it's an easy exercise. And I say finally generated as a monoid, by the way, no, as a group. Yes. Every element is a sum of a bunch of copies of X size. Okay. In this setup, I can consider this mapping telescope, which is just a co-limit of the map adding X. Let me actually define what I mean by this. Well, precisely I mean, well, I have a map M brackets one times M brackets one. Sorry, I have a map X times M brackets one into M brackets one times M brackets one, which is equivalent to M brackets, sorry, I'm doing commutative monoids. This, has, this whole story has a version for non-commutative monoids, but I'm, I'm not going to describe and this is just a multiplication. So this is just X plus, it's just this composition here. And you might expect, if you know this story from, um, from, uh, from classical sort of commutative monoids that the mapping telescope is going to be the group completion. Unfortunately, this is not always the case. And that's what we're going to explore here. So you have a map from the mapping telescope of M to the group completion, which is just coming by comparing this co-limits. And then abusively using X also for the image of X in, in pi note of the group completion here. Hopefully this doesn't create it. But since M is a group, this map is an equivalence. So this is just the group completion. If you want, because if you take my plus, minus X plus gives you exactly an, an inverse to this X plus. So we have this map and this map, you wish this map were an equivalence, but it's not in general. So let me give you an example where this is not. And this is an important example. So let M, so let uh, actually, yeah. Let M be the symmetric monoidal groupoid Excuse me, a short question. Yes. Um, in the example above, did you mean that um, x is then going to be one or four x equals one? I mean, you choose, uh, sorry, uh, you, you choose x is part of the data. I'm giving you a monoid and an element x. And here I'm telling you which element to choose. Ah, okay, so for uh, any monoid and x equal one, because no, not for any monoid, for this monoid. The natural numbers under addition. Oh, okay. So, for, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank for you. For this particular monoid, which is actually the same monoid that will show up in this example uh, of three, say, R mon, 
modules where R is some commutative ring. It doesn't even need to be commutative, but I don't care. I'm going to do a very special case. And so this is an E infinity space because we discussed that symmetric monoidal structures are the same thing as commutative monoid structures. I, I didn't prove it. I said it was a classical theorem. Uh, if you want, it's not actually that hard uh, to, to construct explicitly the infinity structure in this case. Uh, but I, I don't want to anyway. Um, and here I'm going to pick X is going to be, so M as a space is the disjoint union of B, G, L, and R. So this is just, you know, the, the groupoid, this is automorphisms of R, N. And it's group completion is what's known as the free algebraic K theory of R. In general, if you want the algebraic K theory, you need to take the commutative monoid, uh, sorry, the projective, finitely generated projective monoids. And oh, forgot. I always forget in this setting. Uh, if you don't put finitely generated, it turns out that you get zero in the group completion. But I'm going to. And this space is very hard to study. But uh, the, the, the point is that pi one of the group completion is abelian because whatever it is, it's an infinity group. And so you know that it's pi one has to be abelian because the pi one of, an of any H space is abelian. We saw this last semester. Um, now, what is the telescope? Oh, sorry. Uh, in this case, pi zero of M is N given by the dimension of your free R module. And I'm taking X one as before. Now, what is the telescope of M? Well, it's the co-limit of these maps. Well, the map X plus on each connecting component is just BGLN of R to be GLN plus one of R that comes from the map of matrices that sends a matrix A to the block matrix like this. This is the, I'm adding uh, a one dimensional factor on the right hand side. And so if I have an, an automorphism A from V to V, uh, the automorphism on V plus one, V plus one is exactly this thing. Oh, I didn't say the, 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 the symmetric model operation with operation direct sum. Uh, sorry, someone should have asked what, what, uh, what the monoid operation here was. Uh, it's just the direct sum. Okay, so what is this co-limit? So, this turns out to be just Z times BGLR, where GLR is the group of matrices, of infinite matrices that are the identity outside of some finite block. If you unwrap what it is, this is what it is, and in particular, Pi one of tel x m is GL of R, which is not abelian. And that is a problem. <laughs> and that is actually why algebraic key theory is both hard to study and interesting. Yeah. There's this, this mismatch between what you naively would think it is and what it actually is. Okay. So, <laughs> you know what, I don't think I'm going to be able to do the whole proofs, so I'm just going to tell you the important definitions and an idea on how these things work. 
So, important definition is the following. So suppose f from x to y map of spaces, it is a cyclic if for every y in y, the fiber x, y, and remember I'm working homotopy everything, so I do mean the homotopy fiber here, has the homology of a point. So this is z for star zero and zero otherwise. This is not the same as a homology I saw? No. Uh, in fact, that's a first example. That's an exercise slash example. Well, no, it's an example. Actually, no, let me put it a lemma here. Even if I don't prove it, I want to record some consequences. Um, so F is a cyclic. If and only if the square Yeah, so here I have f, f, identity of y, identity of y, is a push-out square. And I mean a homotopy push-out square. And okay, the proof is not hard, but if, instead of the proof, let me recall a bunch of corollary. So if, uh, so every acyclic map is a homology isa. because you just take this push-out square and look at the long exact sequencing homology of this homotopy push-out square. And you see that this forces them up to be homology either. And if uh, Y is simply connected, every homology iso F from X to Y is a cyclic. And that's because uh, uh, since it's a homology ISO, uh, the map from the push out to Y, because then the map from the push out to Y is a homology ISO between uh, simply connected spaces. And the, the, the push out is simply connected by Van Kampen. You know, every time you can cover everything with two uh, simply connected things in a connected intersection. So, but it's not, the vice versa is not true if Y is not simply connected. Uh, and the, the, it is sort of true in the sense that it is true if you ask them up to be an homology for uh, an ISO on homology for all local coefficient systems. But if you've never seen homology with local coefficients, that's all I want to say for now. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, that what, uh, was what I, I was wondering. Uh, okay. And okay, why am I doing this? Because there is this important theorem called the group completion theorem. That says that if M X as above, then the map from the mapping telescope into M is a cyclic. In particular, uh, sorry, I'm in group completion. In particular, uh, we will see, we will consider a case where the mapping telescope is simply connected, in which case the map will be an uh, equivalence because a cyclic map between simply connected uh, spaces are equivalences. And in fact, actually, let me prove 
as likely. So how much time do we have? Let me give you some ideas of how the story continues. Yeah. That is it clear so far? This will allow us to give an explicit description of the group completion in terms of the mapping telescope, actually. Okay, so let's close it. Okay, so, okay, I need to recall a couple of group theory definitions. So, GIA group is perfect if the abelianization is trivial. This, uh, you should have probably seen it before. Uh, and it's hypo, sorry. Let me, uh, every group has a maximal perfect subgroup. A unique. That's because if you have two perfect subgroups, the subgroup generated by them is also perfect. Since perfect, it means that it's generated by commutator of its elements. So if you take the subgroup generated by two groups, you can just take all the commutators of elements in the first group and the commutators of elements in the second group, and they need to generate everything. So this is perfect. So you can just take all the perfect subgroups and take the subgroup generated by all of them, and they're also perfect. So G group is hypo abelian if the maximal perfect subgroup is trivial. Because you probably haven't seen it, but it's sort of a weakening of the notion of an abelian group. Of course, for an abelian group, well, every abelian group is hypo abelian. But we need a, a slight generalization. And uh, we say that the space uh, Y is hypoabelian, uh, X, let's see, is hypoabelian if for every X in X, the fundamental group is hypoabelian. This is just going to be a sh convenient shorthand when the space is not connected. I'm just going to say the space is hypoabelian to mean that all its fundamental groups are hypoabelian. Okay, and then I'm going to, there is this lemma that uh, yeah, suppose f x to y uh, a cyclic map with x hypoabelian. Sorry. Then F is an equivalence. And uh, okay. Uh, why am I doing this? Uh, okay, how do I prove this? Uh, it's enough. to prove uh, that every homotopy, uh, homotopy fiber have, uh, is simply connected. Because then it's, uh, we know that it has the homology of a point and then the Rivich theorem tells us if it's simply connected and has the homology of a point, then it is contractible. And we know that if every homotopy fiber is contractible, the map is an equivalence. As we discussed last time, last year. And okay, so let's pick Y in Y. Then you have, a, uh, sorry, an X in the, fi in the homotopy fiber. Then you get
and get a, a exact sequence of homotopy groups. But we know that this guy is perfect because its abelianization is the homology of the homotopy fiber, which is zero. And the quotient of a perfect group is perfect. So this map lands into the maximal perfect subgroup. And so it's a zero, the zero map. And henceforth, this is a quotient of pi naught, pi two. But pi two is a billion. Is it hypobillion? And uh, well, okay, it's an abelian perfect group. There aren't that many of those. Okay. Let's see how much do I want to say about the next? Okay. Uh, let me just put this theorem here. So for X, any space, there exists a unique X to X plus a cyclic map with X plus hypo abelian. It's called the Quillen plus construction. And I'll explain in a second, how do you construct such a gadget? Uh, moreover, every map X, Y with Y hypoabelian factors through X plus. I'm not sure if I'll do the complete proof of this theorem, but as a corollary, we get, we have our acyclic map given by the group completion theorem. And note that the target here is hypoabelian. It's the pi one is abelian even. So these factors through this is an acyclic map, this is an acyclic map. And in fact, you can check uh, with some care that uh, acyclic maps do satisfy the two out of three property using the push out criterion I told earlier. And so this is an acyclic map from a hypoabelian space. And so it's an equivalence. That is the group completion is the plus construction of the mapping telescope. And as you will see in a second, uh, I'll give you the explicit construction of the plus construction is, is very explicit. You can just write it down. So let me give you the construction of the plus construction and then I will see how much time do we have. I think I'd probably better spend it to answering your question than to giving the proofs of the missing statements that are in the notes. You can actually the, I, you can actually give a complete proof of the group completion theorem and everything using these ideas. Uh, but mm, yeah, let me just give you a construction of the plus construction so that um, so that at least we have something concrete in our hand. And so how does so let's construct such X plus. Uh, so let's first do the case. So uh, we can do it 
on each connected component. So let's assume X connected because acyclic maps only care about connected components anyway and hyperbolean is likewise. So uh, first, let's do the case h1x is zero, or if you want, the pi one is perfect. So let's take alpha i, sorry, s1 to x, generators of uh, of pi one of x. Then we can consider the following fiber sequence. That is, we are attaching a two cell on each alpha i. So for the cofiber sequence, i.e. two cell for each alpha i. And then notice that uh, pi one of x prime is zero by from company. Uh, but this map is not a cyclic, so something is going wrong. So let's look at the long exact sequence in homology. So what do I have? I have H2 of this guy, which is zero, mapping to this right, yes. H2 of X mapping to H2 of X prime mapping to H1 these guys mapping to H1 of X. Now, the point is that uh, by the choice of the alpha I, sorry, uh, we said that X is, is uh, we said that X is uh, is h1 of x is zero so and this is just a free module over i's so we have h star of h prime is just h star of x if star is different from two and h2 of x plus this free guy if star is two uh, I didn't do the case of the other homology groups, but that's that's trivial since the homology of the wedge in that case is zero. So nothing, nothing interesting happens there. So we need to fix that. Now we have pi one of x prime is zero. So h two of x prime is the same thing as the pi two of x prime by Fourier's. And so we can find beta i from S2 to X prime uh, picking a basis for these things, for this summon, the summon that we want to kill. And now we just uh, cone off all this. Bi, I, and we get a space that I'm going to call x plus. Mm. x plus is still zero, and it's still simply connected. And now the long exact sequence in homology shows 
that the composition x goes to x prime goes to x plus is a homology iso. Henceforth is a cyclic since the target is simply connected. Okay, so this was the case where H1 was zero. Very easy, just attach a bunch of cells. And now when, so in the general case, we have P in pi one of X maximal perfect subgroup. Then you know that there is X tilde into X covering space associated to P. So in particular, pi one of X tilde is P. And so H one of X tilde is zero. So we can consider the following, the construction as before of X tilde plus, and this maps to X and you can take the push out and get X plus. And so this map was a cyclic and using the, the push out criterion, it's easy to say that a cyclic maps are stable under push outs. Essentially, because a push out of a push out is a push out. And just, just uh, let me just quickly draw the, the cube that you need. Sorry, W, W. I want to say if all the faces but one of this cube are push outs, so is the last one. And so this map is a cyclic. And then by van Kampen, pi i of x plus is pi i of x mod p is hypoabelian. Sorry. And okay, I, I cannot now have time, I think, to prove that it's a unique one and to give all the details and to prove this, this criterion uh, for the push out, which so in the in the notes, but I was to, I just wanted to, to show you that this is very, very explicit, uh, this plus construction. Although this doesn't really help us computing the homotopy groups of the plus construction, uh, because you know, every time you attach a bunch of cells, the homotopy groups can do crazy things. And in fact, they do crazy things, uh, but still it's not. Okay. And if you, if this vague, quick thing, uh, puzzles you, the, the upshot of this is going to be this. And in fact, we are, we are actually very close to be able to prove the loop completion theorem, but I don't think I want to continue with this story. I think I'm going to put everything in the notes, but not, not say more because I want to talk about vector bundles also. So, okay, so that's it. Are there questions? Excuse me, could you uh, please scroll back to the end? Um, not finished. Yes, sorry. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Maybe, okay, it's going to be written in the notes, but then I should also mention that for the plus construction, I'm following these notes by Marco Iwa, uh, which is literally called, I think, on the plus construction or something like that. I'm going to put a link. Um, there it, it, it works in the context of arbitrary infinity topo, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm translating the proofs for spaces and, and putting them in the notes. It's convenient to work sometimes the plus construction for sheaves of spaces. That's what, why he's, he's working in this added generality. 
uh, but the proofs are fairly elementary, in fact. Uh, you don't need much. And yeah, I think that on Monday I'm going to start talking about vector bundles. Oh, and actually, yeah, let me put as a corollary, right? This free K theory that I defined before is Z times the plus construction of BGL R plus. So it's construction on BGL, BGL infinity R. Uh, that's the definition that sometimes they give in elementary classes and it seems like super confusing. Why would I ever consider this object? And that's because it's the good completion. Of, uh, of the monoid of, of free R modules, uh, which is a, a much more reasonable definition of algebraic key theory, in my opinion. And then, unfortunately, this is not a class on algebraic key theory, so there will be a lot more to say, but uh, at least the definition, since we can give it. Could you maybe simply again um, explain what the plus construction should accomplish? A plus construction, so the point is you have this telescope here. Go back here. You have this telescope here. And you, you really would like it to be uh, the group completion. But it, there, there might be a pi one obstruction because the group completion wants an abelian pi one. And this guy, in general, might not have it. Uh, so the plus construction just fixes this. That's the, the point. Plus construction makes it so, okay, the pi one is not a billion, it's hypo-billion, but okay, it turns out that that's enough for, for running all the arguments we want. And in this case, it will be a billion. Uh, and in fact, actually, the way you prove this theorem is to prove that this map is an equivalence if pi one of m is hypo-billion. And use that the plus, plus construction commutes with, uh, with um, what do you say, it? With, with products to, to get a commutative diagrams like this. And this is going to be an equivalence because m plus is hypo, the pi one of m plus is hypo abelian. And uh, uh, this one is an equivalence because it's still an acyclic map with pi one hypo abelian. And, uh, and this is an acyclic map. And uh, so this is a cyclic. That's one possible proof of that the completion theorem. It's not the original proof, but I like it. It's due to Thomas Nicolaus, I believe. Yeah. I'm going to put references to all of these in, in the notes anyway. Uh, So I, I, hopefully this, this sort of justifies why the plus construction needs to be introduced. And I also have to say that, okay, let me actually stop the recording unless there are other questions.